Hi, Daisies. This is a trigger warning. This episode deals with themes of addiction, substance abuse, homelessness, and depression. Hi, everyone. Welcome to part two of our interview with Mark Weber. I am your host, Sarah Wright Olson. And I am Mark Weber's wife. Teresa Palmer, who is also one of the hosts <laughs> of The Mother Days. Mark Weber is an actor of many Hello. movies, filmmaker, dad of five kids, um, an all-round amazing inspirational guy. And we are going to jump right back into part two of the Mark Weber interview. Thanks, guys. <laughs> There's a, a level of sabotage that I think they talk about in AA um, that when life feels so good, you feel unworthy of it and so you sabotage it because you feel like it's going to leave you. It's going to, that good stuff is going to abandon you so you'll just sabotage it now to get the pain over and done with. Is that... Is that the right sort of explanation of that? Well, yeah, to a certain extent, I think what you're talking about specifically with me is that I all I ever have known is like trauma and drama and stress and pain and adversity. Mm -hmm. And like my nervous system is so attuned to like be on the lookout and to also think, I gotta. I, I need to get out of here at any moment, or someone's gonna leave at any moment. I'm like, what the fuck is going on at all times? Like, my nervous system's like, ah, 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 and you know, not. Mm -hmm. it, and so you get addicted to that feeling that when things are okay, mm -hmm. you're like, wait, no, this can't. This this can't really be okay. Something terrible is gonna happen, you know, because you're wired that way, and so. Mm -hmm. Some of the sabotage can come in that. You can actually end up creating drama or more pain for yourself because you need to replicate it some way because that's what you're used to and accustomed to. So I would definitely do that a lot. You know, I would make things harder, overthink things, put myself in shitty situations because I was so accustomed to being able to deal with shitty things. And never in a million years did I think that I deserved or allowed to be at peace and happy and like connected with my mm -hmm. children mm -hmm. and not really have any problems. Um, and so it took me a while to get there. You know, when I, I, I really had to sit in an understanding and an awareness of why I developed a problem with addiction, um, with drugs. And, you know, I, had tricked myself early on when we first met that like, oh, I'm cured. And here's the tricky thing, right? Mm -hmm. For me. That's is right. you learn in in 12 step programs that once you're an addict, you're always an addict. And you can't do anything ever again. Cause if you do, you're gonna be out on the street shooting dope and you're gonna die and your life's over. And that's pretty much true, but in my journey with sobriety and really doing the work on myself, it's not entirely true. And so mm -hmm. much of 12-step programs work by being all or nothing. You know, it feels like mm -hmm. this is what it is in its entirety. And there's this yeah, whole subset. It saves people's lives. It's really designed to get junkies off the street, you know? Yeah. You got it gets people to stop, put the needles down, put the pill bottles down, put the booze down, and get enough time where they start to actually operate without substances in their body. Of course, you need yeah. to think, I can never touch something again. Otherwise, I'm gonna. You need that. You need to create that gap in order to really do the work. But there's this whole subsect in sobriety and and new age sobriety is kind of what I call it nowadays, where you know they're there's beautiful new work in studies that are being done on people who are using psychedelics and psychedelic experiences mm -hmm. to help cure mm -hmm. their trauma, 
to bring themselves out of horrible, morbid depression and to find a new way of being, right? And so right. it's a really right. interesting time right now that I'm really excited about for people because I've known a lot of people in sobriety who don't do drugs, but they're fucking miserable. And they're the worst people, right. you know. It's like they're, it's like God. You why don't you go have a glass of wine? Jesus Christ! It's like stopping drugs is just the beginning, right? It's sobriety puts you on a journey right. of doing real self work, and that extends itself beyond just the twelve steps, you know. And for me, what has happened in my life is that I've done the work, and I have evolved. And I no longer mm -hmm. identify with being an addict anymore. And I, because mm -hmm. I struggle, because I, I, you know, I live my life through a series of affirmations and believing certain things about myself. And I really started to feel a bit like a fraud when I would sit in a room and say, I'm Mark, I'm an alcoholic. Because, you know, inside I'm like, I don't really feel like that anymore. <laughs> I, I feel like mm -hmm. I'm changing and I yeah. don't like affirming this thing. Like I, and, and I'm really mm -hmm. mindful about sharing that because I do not want to deter, deter anybody from stopping all substances. Cause I think it's beautiful and I prefer to yeah. live my life not on substances. And I have a hard line for me too. Like I can never and will mm -hmm. never do a pill in my entire life. I can't, I know I can't, mm -hmm. I know I will die, but I've shifted the way in which I define my sobriety. And right. um, the real good stuff comes when you don't need to take something in order to feel okay. The same way we know yeah. that external situations and things that we get shouldn't, we shouldn't need those to make ourselves feel okay. We should just exist and feel happy and, and, and presence and joy without needing anything. And so mm. um, that's where, that's the standard that I set for myself. And I'm, I'm happy mm -hmm. that I'm in a place right now in my life where I don't identify with being a drug addict anymore and that I've mm -hmm. moved on from that. And I've healed myself from the pain that I've experienced um, and the deep trauma that I went through in my life. And that's not to say that I don't have bad days and days where I, that mm -hmm. pain comes up again, but the way that I manage that pain now is in a healthy way. How, yeah. how do you manage it now? Because Teresa has spoken about dark Mark on our podcast yeah. before. And so how, when dark Mark comes in, how do you manage it? What are you doing? Is it like, you need to go do meditation? Are, 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 you like are you journaling? People are yeah. probably like, tell it's me about Mexico. We've mentioned it a thousand times. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, oh, right. Mexico. We had a, okay. we we had a family. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, we had a family trip to Mexico, okay? And then like a little <laughs> side sweep over in Sayulita and like everything <laughs> went right down the old tube and the guacamole got real bad. <laughs> real bad. I, uh, I went on a little side journey to get a backpack and also mm -hmm. a bunch of pills <laughs> because you know, a, 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 another an, another part of my uh story because i just brought up the vicodin mm -hmm. but for me what really took me out was xanax and it's the Xanax. those are the ones for me that was like i thought oh i just want to feel like this from the opiates but when i had my first xanax and Klonopin, i was like no this is how I want to feel because it was the, it's such mm -hmm. a quick fix. And the reason why they're so addictive is that anyone who struggles with a really intense nervous system, who's in a fight or mm -hmm. flight response at all times, um, experience any PTSD, any type of, you know, anxiety, it works, it works fast. And you're like, oh, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. I can breathe again. Ah, oh, I shouldn't really worry about that. And the, you know, just like opiates, it, it it's even more addictive because you need to take more and more and more and more to have that feeling. And unfortunately, it's how most people that I know and love have died. It's the combination of when you mm -hmm. bring in one of those benzos mixed with drinking or an opiate, that's where you just 
Yeah. Stop breathing in your sleep and you never wake up. And Mark yeah. had gotten you to know, a place where he liked the taste, the chemical taste. For someone who is so organic and natural and like Mr. of the Earth, it was such a contrast to all of those beliefs that he has about wellness and health. Um, yeah, but yeah. He, he he got into the taste of the chemicals of it all crushed up and he'd put it under his tongue. And Sarah and I, by the way, we don't, her and I don't know much about addiction, even though I'd been through a relapse That's, of Mark before. I still I was the person that was the last person to be able to tell that Mark was on pills that first time around. It was yeah. my best friend Annabelle. I had who's no like, idea. Teresa yeah. and Annabelle's, um, both her parents had passed away from addiction. So she knew she, my best mm. friend was like, Teresa Marks on substances. And I was like, really? He just seems like he's in a really good mood. <laughs> and Annabelle's like, no, 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 there's yeah. something going on. That's, that's <laughs> and then that's, Sarah that's and I and definitely. Eric, we were on the plane and I kept, were, were you guys like a few seats back from us? We were, Yeah. We were we were in coach uh, a few seats back. You guys were you had you guys had the like um, what are those called like the bulkhead seats? They had a little bit more leg room, and we were yeah a little bit further back. But you would come, you were like turning around to like talk to us, right? Or no, Eric kept going like, up to talk to you. Yeah, I kept running back down to you guys, being like, "Mark's falling asleep. He's he's talking in his sleep. He's yeah, I don't know what's going on. Like he definitely seems out of it." And Eric would and come Eric up and was check like, and he was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah there's something he's, he's going on." Something. on. And I and had we, seen and were like, Mark. really? <laughs> yeah, we were so. I was like, no, surely not. Like, I, he's sober. Uh, but then I remember, I remember seeing him. Remember him? I'm talking about you, baby. I saw you uh, um, when we were in Mexico, and we were having a night out, and I was drinking a wine. Yes. And I, I we turned around, and did he? He went back. You went you back, and you had no, no, the rest of the wine. He took something. a sip of yeah. He took a sip of the wine, and then Teresa and I were like, did we? Did he? Did we see that? Was that no? And we were both just like, "That's not. That didn't happen, right?" Yeah, did you just take a sip of that? I, yeah. It's so but that sad. again, it's me so... being so like blinded that I had no idea. Again, really. But luckily, that was a very quick. That was like what twenty four hours, babe. Anything yeah. longer would have been. Um, it would. It the was amount a, that you yeah, were it taking. Would... It would have been. Probably would it was have 24 died. hours and then yeah. you were uh, yeah you would you have died off. that time round thinking yeah. of how much you had taken in the 24 hours and so we mm. landed at LAX and I called Frankie who is yeah. my sister wife uh, who is Mark's ex-girlfriend mother of the child Isaac that we all share together I called Frankie and Zach and I was like this has happened I haven't, I didn't tell Mark that I could tell he was messed up, but he was, but you were so messed up. You were trying to fill out a landing card and it was just scribbles. And I think you did a couple of smiley faces or something. And I was like, <laughs> okay, someone's going to help me. It was, I think it was um, Christmas Eve. So <laughs> was. I was, and then, so Frankie, I was at the um, airport, not saying anything to you. We were just getting the bags and just making everything very normal. And then um, I called Frankie and I was like, can you call around for the rehabs? And so she started calling and then Frankie, Zach and I and Mark and Bodie and Forrest, oh, not Forrest wasn't around then, Bodie and Isaac, we all had Christmas Day together but the plan was um, we would – open the presents and stuff but then Mark's best friend and sponsor Daniel was going to arrive on Christmas Day and then we were yeah. going to have an intervention on Christmas Day which is what we did we ended up orchestrating this whole thing where we dropped the kids off at Frankie's best friend's house and then the four of us all sat down and just talked about how much we love Mark and we love you and we know you love your children and you know it's time to go to rehab and so um, and you were so beautiful and everyone all cried together and it was actually such a bonding, vulnerable, amazing experience and um, I just feel so grateful that we have that relationship with Frankie and Zach that like we're family, we're family. So family came together and um, and you were so good about I think there was like really very little resistance. You were like, 
Mm. I'm ready. I'm ready. And also, wasn't that the place that you went to, Mark, where you were really that place really focused on trauma and you were yeah, able it's, to it's like amazing it's was a, it, it, am i thinking of the right place yeah, yeah. It's, a re, it's a rehab in arizona in wickenburg arizona called the meadows and i mm. it was you know terrifying and horrible at first but then it was like i almost didn't want to leave and i often find myself wanting mm-hmm. to go back and recreate those feelings mm. um and take more classes it was like a university it felt like it was i was i went to college you know where i graduated high school yeah. i got my yeah. Mm-hmm. diploma in and yeah there's hardcore um trauma work that's done and that's where i finally unpacked the core Mm-hmm. Um, and got to the root cause of why I kept picking up these substances in particular. And it yeah. changed my life. And I love it so much. It was an incredible place to go. And you can go to for other stuff. Yeah. Like people can go. I, I There's so many people that I know in life that would benefit so much from going there. Um, mm. You know, the only scary part of it is it's it's a, it's not fancy. It's not like a cushy yeah. Malibu rehab. Yeah. Like I had a shitty little dorm room with my friend mm-hmm. who didn't make it. Um mm. who was on our first night staying in the room. He was like, Hey Mark, just so you know, like if I yell and scream in the middle of the night, don't try to wake me up because I might kill you. And I was like, Okay, Aww. and my friend, I won't say the name, <laughs> but it was a, 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 yeah. an army ranger. It was a ranger in the army who had hardcore mm. PTSD. And I would have every oh, other really night just have to heart. like lay there and try to sleep, you know, detoxing mm. off these substances with this, this man just wailing in his sleep you know and i was like that really breaks my heart oh my god this guy and the stories from him and what he's you know he experienced in life was just like oh my god but that's the other great thing about sobriety too is we all have a you know you have this tendency us as everyone i mean everyone we do this we feel special right and Mm. we think oh my god no one has experienced these things like I've experienced. No one's ever done this. No one, they couldn't have done this. Mm-hmm. They, no one's fought this. And then you sit down with people in sobriety and you're like, holy shit. Like, not only mm-hmm. have you done those things and fought those things, you've done stuff that I wouldn't ever do. Or, you know, and so what that yeah. does is it takes away the shame. Because the shame that you yeah. have surrounding your struggles is what really takes you out, I feel like. You know, mm. it's like the quicker you can bring things into the light, the quicker you can resolve them. Yeah. And it breaks my heart hearing you guys talk about the airplane. I don't remember a thing. I don't remember anything. Oh. I don't remember one moment mm. of being on that airplane yeah. at all. Mm. I could not tell you a thing from it and that's so scary and yeah you know big portions of my life you know and they've now pinpointed the exact you know chemical reaction that happens in your brain from these benzos that it it literally erases your memory like you you don't yeah remember things it's an actual real thing that happens and so Mm. You know, my heart goes out to anyone who are still struggling with those yeah. with those drugs. You know, they're really scary. And, um, you know, I, I do know that they can be helpful for some folks in certain situations, but they are so scarily addictive that yeah. Um, yeah. my recommendation would be to never take one. You know, if, if anyone... Ever take one. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's like you don't maybe don't take it for the airplane flight or whatever like how people use it because they they're really just do a little bit more research into those things in particular anyone who is is thinking about using those because i feel like they're like evil they just are like the worst 
But yeah, well, I'm, I yeah. will say that as one of your friends and, you know, from an outside perspective, I watched you go through that, you know, you went to that rehab and then came back. And then I saw the two of you together and I sat in conversation with you guys and just like, you know, we all, I think we all in our own way go through different moments of like evolution in our lives. And we go, you know, there's moments where we're growing and we're growing and growing. And then we really grow like in a big Mm -hmm. way. And then, or, and then sometimes we're stuck and then sometimes we like, you know, it's big. And so there are moments in my life where I can go like in terms of my relationship or my communication or myself as a mother or like my priorities in life, I can look at moments of like big, you know, massive growth. But I remember looking at you and listening to you and watching you and you you and Teresa together. And I was just like, wow, like what you guys Mm -hmm. have and watching you guys like communicate after all of that. And, you know, the way that you talked about um, this place and, and, you know, how you were able to work through and pinpoint and all this stuff that you're talking about. It was just so beautiful. And you're, you've are you always been such a beautiful human being. Like when Eric and I, every time we talk about you to anyone, we're just like, oh, he's the most oh, beautiful human because you wear your heart on your sleeve. You're so, so open. True. You're so honest. You're so raw. You're so oh, kind. So you're lucky. like always so thoughtful. Uh, and then, I, you know, seeing you with Tez and your babies and everything after this, like it was just... Um, it's just, it's, it's just amazing. And, and as your friend, I, I, you know, listening to you tell the story and like where you've come from and, you know, how you got to this place. And I remember that being such a moment of growth uh-huh. um, for you guys. And there was so much going on in your relationship at that time too. Oh, I was like trying you to wanted to have another baby. Oh, it was ridiculous. <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> but you know what? Honest to God truth. And Mark knows this now. The honest to God truth was like, I knew he was my home and I loved him yes. so much and I knew, knew he had the potential to get through it, but I kept thinking if he can't get through it, if this does break us up, because it would manifest itself in like he was, he'd was he get really jealous when I, like with co-stars, yeah. if I was working on things and like that for me had, it, that had a bit of an erosive effect and I was like, oh, my gosh, oh, my gosh. But The breakdown to breakthrough was everything for us. But me, my obsession with wanting to get pregnant at that time, and I think we've talked about this before, Mark, was like I didn't want Bodhi to be alone. I didn't want him to have to go between Mark's house and my house and back and forth if we break up by himself. So (laughs) then like when he was in rehab, I was like, are we going to stay together? I think we're going to stay together. But if we're not going to stay together, I definitely need <laughs> Bodhi to have a full sibling so that he's not by himself <laughs> so the two of them have each other. And then, like, we fell back in love. I mean, we were always in love, but we fell deeper and deeper and deeper and reconnected. Mm. Um, do you remember we did a ceremony with our wedding rings? I don't know if you remember this, mm. but, like, right after you came out of rehab, we did this, like, rebirthing ceremony to like rewrite the narrative and like start again Mm. and it was such a beautiful symbolic thing for us and I I love that saying the breakdown to break through because that's what happened for us and then our Mm. marriage has just from that moment I think it just it up leveled us in every way going to rehab new getting to do that that healing. Um, but I did want to, before we go, we've got about 10 minutes left. I did want to um, speak to what Sarah asked about, which is this dark mark, because I have mentioned dark mark before on the podcast. And now people have a better <laughs> understanding of like where that comes from and what happens. And I think with Mark and I, like we have such this, we do, babe, we have a, such an amazing relationship. And we always say like the only thing that like is like hard for us, it's challenging for us um, is when this stuff comes up for you and it derails us. And I sometimes feel I've, I've described it as like being on this ship and we're just like on this cruise, we we're on our cruise with our kids and life's amazing. You know, you have, we have everything we could possibly have ever dream dreamt of in our lives. That's how I feel. And then it feels as though 
it gets like suddenly steered into like an iceberg or into the rocks and that Mark's at the <laughs> helm. He's the one taking us over there. He's like, destruction. And I oh. can get resentful and sometimes I am not patient enough with you, Mark, because I'll be like, what more could you possibly want? Like you have everything. We're so lucky. We're so grateful. Just be grateful. And I'm, I fail to remember that this is like a day in, day out childhood conditioning. And so I've been trying to soften and be more patient. And I've just recently, you might notice this, babe, I've been saying, I, I saw this on Instagram and I think it's genius. Do you want comfort? or solutions. So I've been asking Mark that recently, like, babe, do you want oh my comfort? God, you're or do you so need Eric sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You two are so similar, Sarah and Mark. And you it. guys, are, and me and Eric are so similar in so many ways. Oh, no. And I just you asked her the other day. So, it's so <laughs> funny. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's so funny hearing you yeah. say that because I, I swear he has a saying that's like, okay, okay, do you want me to, like, do you want me to support you right now or do you want me to fix like do you want me to go into fixing mode you know like that's what he he's like so sweet but he's like do you need okay i'm just i'm trying to just sit here and listen i'm gonna listen i want to fix it but i'm also just gonna sit here and listen (laughs) i love it you should tell him about the comfort and solutions thing too sarah i will (laughs) but you responded really well the other day you the other day he was like i just want comfort and I was like, oh, my God. That's yeah. what I come, usually say. Yeah. yeah, I was like, oh, yeah. we hugged um, and yeah. it was so I'm going to choose comfort over solutions all the time, uh, pretty much. Um, <laughs> say, I'm like, I, I need a hug. <laughs> yeah. So, so the way that I comfort myself and give myself and get to the place where, because you got to comfort yourself and then I can get to solutions, right? And, and I, I need to... Mm-hmm. I, you know, dark mark, what can I say? I, it's, you know, I like to keep things interesting, babe. Um, I, and, and, and here's the thing, part of, um, uh, but I'm like, I just I want part, simple. Uh, That's what I always say. I'm like, I just want it simple. I know. <laughs> and you're never going to get that simple, babe. Oh, um, that with you, which I love you. Simple, love you simple, so much, so. simple is boring. It's boring. It's boring. There's it definitely, is boring. You know, yeah, it, we don't, we don't want simple. <laughs> yeah, there's there, and so part of part of it for me is right. Is the best way that I deal with dark mark is I love dark mark. I've gotten to the place where I love all parts of myself. I used to really brutally attack myself for feeling unhappy or mm. not having a steam, you know, or feeling bleak or mm-hmm. feeling uh, worn out and worried and cheerful. And I would, you know, kind of attack myself and I've learned, no, nope, you need to hug that part of yourself. You need to come and comfort yourself. You mm. need to say, you know what? I love you, man, no matter what. And, and, show myself unconditional real love some of that some of which i was lacking from a father figure right so i've had to learn how to give myself unconditional yeah. love and part of that is through accepting the fact that you, through all the work that i've done in my life and how much i've grown and evolved i think there are certain experiences that i've had in my life and certain things that i've seen and been around that I'm always going to have a little something there. And I don't know if it's ever going to go away, right? That there's always mm. this, mm. I, and I've just had to learn to love that side of myself. You know, I've, I've yeah. um, gotten so much better. And I think that there's always more work to do, but I have gotten better at accepting the fact that I think, you know, I've been through some stuff and there's every now and then, there's going to be a little edge, a little something, the way I'm wired. I'm, I'm maybe going to. little edge. You know. And sometimes it's the people closest to you who it gets taken out on. And that's okay yeah, too. Yeah. And that's totally fine. Um, well, <laughs> and but I it's, have but I've yeah, learned look, to love Dark Mark as well. <laughs> but that being said, it's not always okay. And there's levels in. in versions of it right and so while i'm talking about accepting myself and knowing that maybe there's always going to be a part of myself where i'm going to have days that go pretty dark and i 
simply just based off of the relationship with my father. Cause like, even as I start to think about mm. it or want to talk about it right now, I'm like, I feel the like tears come behind my eyes and I feel a little, Ooh, and I'm like, it's you can always, cry. I've yeah. cried on here. <laughs> We've cried. It's always, <laughs> been tears. I almost cried. It's always, yeah. It's always right there under the surface, you know, because I, I reconnected with my dad. Mm. I made a film mm. with my dad. I forgave my dad, but mm. you know, he was gone my whole life. And then my dad just died, yeah. you know, and, mm-hmm. and I knew he was going to die as I was forgiving him. And it mm-hmm. is beautiful mm-hmm. to forgive your father and, and to get reconnected with him, but still sitting with the fact that I wasn't still okay with not having him around my whole life because it really hurt me. And yeah. I don't know if I'll yeah. I don't know if I'll ever be okay with that. I can I've intellectualized it, I've processed it, and I understand and mm-hmm. I really truly do forgive my father. Um mm-hmm. but I'm still processing his death. You know, there's a part of me that gets really angry. I'm pissed that he's gone, you know, and I and I'm And Mark, you are this sucks. The and most sometimes you gotta just sit and how stuff sucks. Yeah. Oh, thanks, baby. Um, you have used not used it, but I think just like as a result of not having a father in your life, it has done something to you as a father. And I'm sure that you can mm. speak to that. But yeah. you are, I've never met anyone so just beautifully, gently in tune and just so perceptive with those children. You know what each and every one of them need and at what point they need it and you can tell when things are intuitively going on with those children that I'm just like mind blown by and it's I'm sure it is there's something about the narrative of not having a father that you want to show up and be the very best most present dad that you can be totally it's the it's it's that thing of like you know it's the it's the gift that comes from that struggle you know it's like by my dad not being around well i had you know a clear version of who i don't want to be as a dad i want to be there but mm-hmm. i think i was just thinking about it it still shows up for me. it's my deepest wound so where it showed up for me a lot mm. is with isaac right i don't i have one child mm-hmm. that i don't get to be with all the time and I'm the only person experiencing yeah. that. I'm the only person who has this person yeah. besides his mom. And I really, it hurts. So when I'm not around him or when we leave mm. for extended periods of time, it gets me right back into my deepest wound, you know? And yeah. I had to tell yeah. Isaac on the walk the other day, because he's 14, I had to say, hey, but just so you know, this is my deepest wound. So when you joke mm. like, oh, you're abandoning me, it's really hard for me, you know? And, um, yeah. and, and mm. so, it, and we and have so, to so look many at ways Isaac like and this. how well adjusted he is. Yeah, totally. To- yes. And it's, it's, he, and he is, and he's amazing. And he's not, he's at that place in his life where he can make a joke like that with me because it's not real for him. He doesn't feel abandoned. Yeah. He feels totally loved. And, mm-hmm. but it's again, this deep conditioning yeah, yeah. and wiring, um, that it, it, it shows up for me, um, still. And that's why dark Mark can come on. And, but while I've mm-hmm. learned how to accept myself for all things, I've also, realize really important things in a relationship and back to being a great teammate is like, yo, dude, maybe don't push your teammate away, you know, like say, Hey, I need some help, you know? Um, Hey, I'm sorry. I'm having an emotional thing right now. This is why can't really stop it right now. Gonna kind of have to go through it. And just getting better at, at sharing that more with you, babe, and having you create the yes. space where you're like, okay, mm. you don't need to solve it right away, but don't be mean to me, you know? And I'm like, right, totally. Don't be mean to you. <laughs> yeah. Like, don't. 
I was going to suggest to people because I, I jokingly said before, it's okay, you just deal with it. But actually, from my perspective, like you can, if your partner is going through something and you know they're in a really, they're just taking it out of themselves and they're in an emotionally dark place and because you're the closest person to them, you are getting the ripple effect of that and it can be it can be painful. Like I have felt even like just last year, I went through a period where I was like, oh, it's too much. It's too much. There's so much of it coming. And I just don't want like the constant, the drama or the heaviness of the feeling when I just like, I want to show up and I just want us to be happy and in a good place with the kids and like being present with each Mm. other. And because we are when we are like that, which is the majority of the time, it just feels so amazing. So I always am like, oh, we've been derailed again. But I think setting a loving boundary and saying like, Mark knows I'm not abandoning him. I'm with you. I love you. I'm here for you. I'm listening yeah. to you. But I can also put a boundary in place to say like, hey, I understand you're going through it, but that's actually feeling hurtful to me what you're saying feels hurtful to me and your distance feels hurtful so if you can Mm. communicate it with me like let me in let me in on what's going on and let me know how I can be of service if I can be of service by just like holding it down with the kids and I'll hold down the fort with them or you can have some time to like process what you're going through or speak to one of your friends great. Or if you just like really just want affection right now and you want me to get a babysitter and we'll get a babysitter for the kids and we're going to spend quality time together. It's, I think in relationship, it's so great to have that communication. And that's what I think I've asked of you, Mark, is like, just share it with me. Just before you come at me with the darkness, just like, tell me it's happening. This is what's going on. It's, this is how we can move through this, babe, and we can do it together as a team. That feels really great. Yeah, totally. And that's, and while it be, while I was touting how great our communication is, it, I falter with it when, because I, I was basically by having someone leave you, I got conditioned to have to Mm -hmm. be the best to make people want to stay right so i struggle when i start to yeah yeah be fall under my highest uh level of how i want to be my conditioning makes me think well she's gonna leave because people just leave if you're not yeah yeah fucking amazing at all times and totally well adjusted and where we've gotten better with that is i've learned oh hold on no 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 she's not leaving share what you're going through and bring it into the light. And what has happened, I think, over the last few years is that the amount of time it takes me to move through something and pull out of something has become quicker and quicker. And that's like the, that's, it's cool. It's like an exercise now. It's like the, this, there's these little skills that we learn in relationship that require practice and they get better and stronger. It's like building a, a new muscle. You know, I know that when we're in an argument, it doesn't even fucking matter what we're arguing about at this point. I know the first person who can (laughs) tap out and just be like, you know what? I'm sorry. You're so much better at that. I'm overreacting. Than I am. I don't even, I don't even, we're arguing. Yeah, I'm terrible at that. It's like, can we, yeah, no, you are. But Me too. I can't say, I cannot be the first one to say sorry. (laughs) Never. It's, it's. It's great. It's imp- It's a good one to learn. It's a good one to learn, and you feel. Yeah, I and feel I it. It literally for feels marriages, like flexing a muscle. And for for yeah. partnership, oh, you can hear the kookaburras outside. Can you hear that? Can you hear the kookaburra? Is, is that a bird? A, a kookaburra. The kookaburra. The Australian kookaburra. You don't know about the kookaburra. The kookaburra. <laughs> oh, it's our iconic bird. Like, the Australian like, iconic bird. <laughs> oh, anyway, I've that's never the, heard that's of the Australian bird <laughs> outside. <laughs> Hilarious. You're like a kookaburra. <laughs> Sounds gorgeous. <laughs> oh my god, it's so funny. Anyway, what I was gonna say. Oh, now I've lost my train of thought. Have I? No. Anyway, in partnership. Oh, I'm sorry. 
No, no, that was my yeah. fault. I heard the kookaburra. It's it's my ADHD, <laughs> ADD, ADHD. Yeah. Um, anyway, mm-hmm. um, in <gasps> partnership, what's really good is to find your um, find your pattern. What is your pattern? And our pattern, yes. we know what our pattern is. Mark will start with the there'll be something. I his emo dark Mark will come out, and then I'll hold space for a minute, and you know maybe like twenty four yes. hours, and then all of a sudden I come in and I can get nasty. I can come in with like the big big guns. I come in and I drop the little like mean digs at him, and then that will get him to go on top of me, and then I'll and then I will never be the first person to pull out of it. I'll just go bigger and bigger and bigger and angrier and crazier. <laughs> and then um, he is the one. Sorry, the, comu- the <laughs> computer is going to die. Oh, my God. Oh, oh, wait. No, just come finish it here. Come finish it okay, okay. next to me. Um, anyway, so. Hi, sorry. My computer was going to die. And I don't want it. To, but I feel like I should plug hey. it in too so we don't lose the thing. Yeah. Should you? Is it actually going to die? Yeah. Remember how you said what? It's because if it's not plugged in, it'll die and then it'll Oh, come. yes. Okay. We need to plug it in. He needs to plug it You're in. You're right. You're right. Go <laughs> plug it in. But this is a good moment. Yeah, great moment. Anyway, so this what is a great I was going to say is like if you're in partnership with your person, oh, my God, he's really going for it. That's a lot of noise. There's a lot of drama. Um. Anyway, in partnership, when you establish what your patterns are, um, it's really good to know what they are so that when you're in them, it's easier to recognize, wait, hang on a second, we're in our pattern. We're in our routine yeah. of how we argue. Yeah. And then you, it's so much easier to be like, whoa, 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 let's stop ourselves. We're doing the thing that we do. And so I'll be curious yes. to hear from other listeners if they're able to do that. We know what our patterns are, who starts what, where it yeah. goes, how it escalates and how how we can de-escalate it oh god anyway um i was actually gonna say that the other day um i went you know eric had a lot of stuff going on with work and um and I could feel that the energy was different, but I couldn't figure out like what it was. And he was like, had, you know, multiple projects that he was working on. And so just the energy shift, um, I was, I was just saying that I, the other day I could feel like the energy shift with Eric when he was like working on a whole bunch of different things. And I was like, I was, couldn't really figure out what's going on. And I was like, is, is something with me? Like, I, and of course the first thing I think is like, I did something wrong or like I'm doing something. something that's annoying him or like, there's like something right. I'm of course I'm going to make it about myself. And so, um, but I was like, you know, that would be my own pattern would be to just sort of like shove it under the rug and like, kind of just pretend like nothing's happening and like, you know, try to go about everything. But that's not where we are anymore in, in our life and, and this age and this place in our relationship. So instead I go to him and I go, Hey, I can feel that there's like a little bit of an energy shift. You know, I'm sure it's because you have a lot going on right now. Um, but is, is it, is there anything that I'm doing and is there anything I can do to help? And he was just like, Oh my gosh, I'm so glad that you said something Mm -hmm. like this has nothing to do with you. And you know, he was like, yeah, this is what I'm dealing with right now is a B C D and E. And I was like, Oh great. Okay. How about I do this? You go do that. And I'm going to go pick up the kids and then you can finish that. And then we can all reconvene like, you know, together once we're back. And he was like, okay, great. So it was just nice because, you know, in a, in years and years and years ago in this relationship, you know, back at the beginning, I would have been like, Oh, like, I don't know what's going on. And I would have not wanted to be in it and ask the questions. And then, you know, now Mm -hmm. it's like just talking about what you guys are saying about how you can really pick up on the nuances in a relationship. And there's so many ways in which, you know, things can go bad because you take things on personally or you don't hit the problem head on or you're trying to like skirt around it. And instead, like you guys are sitting in it and you're having the conversation, even when it's like, okay, even when we're in an argument and, you know, it's not exactly going the way that you want it to, but you're able to like, you know, step up and say, like here's our things that we were saying. So anyway, it was, here's our pattern. Exactly. Our pattern. Um, So (laughs) I feel like listeners will be able to relate to that (laughs) because every, 
every relationship has a dynamic and everyone has like the typical yes. like go-to of how an argument escalates and then who's the one that de-escalates or who's like the one that comes yeah. in and is yes. like the, the aggressor or who's a, and I know like I know how to like twist or push his little buttons when we're in argument yeah. um, and I know that he's going to be the one to get us out of it he's always the one to get us out of it which I'm working on now and of mm. course so funny I see it with Bodie Bodie's so similar to me when I see him and um, Forrest in their little interactions I was like oh Forrest literally is Mark in every way and so is Bodie <laughs> me in every and I was like Forrest will always be the first to be like sorry wow. But it's so funny because I'm more triggered by Bodie, <laughs> and I'm like, Bodie, it's you. You yeah, need to say course. sorry, and I'm like, mm, I'm actually talking to myself here. <laughs> yeah, it's your, That's it's the wild. mirror. It's like yeah. you talking yes. to your like younger child, and you're telling yourself like, you know, the things that bother us with our kids, the things that we're triggered the most by, are usually the things that we do that you know yeah. we don't 100%. like that we yes. do, and it it. It, uh, it like triggers us. And so we're like, oh, I can't believe this is what, you know, blah, blah, blah is doing. And then you're like, oh, wait, but I do that every day. Like every yeah. single and day. When and when yeah. I, I have one last that. question, Mark, when, <laughs> when are you and Eric doing the Your Zen Papa podcast? When is this happening? Can it happen, Exactly. Please? We need it. You guys are well, such me... thoughtful men. And I would love that. Well, let me tell you something. Step in the right direction. I may have okay. <laughs> purchased that domain, yourzenpapa.com, like a year ago. Maybe oh, a year no ago. Way. Yes, you did. <laughs> it's rolling. It's in the works, y'all. Uh, well, I got to say, yeah. Mark, having you on here was so amazing. You are such a beautiful, open, wonderful human. I love your love story. I love your relationship. I love that you came on to just have these conversations about love and addiction mm -hmm. and growth and our, in your childhood and that dreams work story. Teresa has told me before. So when you posted something about it on your Instagram the other day, I was Thanks. fully crying. I mean, I was on my Girl. period, but I was like fully crying. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so emotional. And I was like, oh. I was like, dreams work. They do, you know, like dreams reading your work. post. And it was just, it made me cry because hey, dreams work. Because it was just Great. so no, like, wow, what you've, you know, all of us, we, the way that, um, you know, you've like, the, what you've come from and, and where you are and just also I have to note just listening to you um, today, like listening to your story and the way that you told your story, every step of your story, you talked about gratitude. And when we're talking mm -hmm. about like, you know, manifesting and dreams coming true and, you know, things that you want in your life and the positivity and just going back to traumas that we have in our life. But you go back and you talk about your gratitude at every single step. I'm grateful for those experiences. I'm grateful for this. No, I wouldn't want my children to have this, to go through that, but I'm grateful that I was in it. And I have to say that I noticed it and noted it throughout our whole entire two podcasts that we just recorded that, um, your constant state of gratitude. And I think it's just a thing for all of us to take a moment and really listen to and think about and marinate on. Mm. Because um, I think sitting in a place of gratitude really can transform your life. And it transforms yeah, your experiences and the way that you look at things and what you hold on to. And so thank you for that, because I will be taking yes. that into my, you know, days on from this. Oh, and thanks, I want to say of that course. I really hope that Mark, your story can be an inspiration to other people who might look at people in the film industry and think, oh, that's not attainable. Like I come from here, I come from this kind of neighborhood or I don't have any right. money or I am living in a place of poverty. And I do think that your story can be largely, hugely inspirational to so many people. And um, so I really appreciate yes. you going in depth and sharing every aspect of your story unfiltered. It's really beautiful. Of course, guys, thank you so much. I love being here. I love having these conversations. <laughs> I mm. love you both so much. I've gotten so much out of just sitting here reliving and thinking about stuff and having to articulate it and share it. And my biggest takeaway about this 
process and doing this with you guys and thinking about, well, God, how have I made it is I do share it. And I would love to encourage mm -hmm. anybody out mm -hmm. there right now who's struggling with addiction or depression or any type of doubt or fear or self-worth issues is to share it. Don't be afraid to ask for help because you're not alone mm -hmm. and none of us should do this alone. No part of my story, I didn't do it alone. Um, and dreams really do work and it's important to be grateful. And you know, it's a quick way to get out of feeling shitty is to quickly do a quick little gratitude list. Look around, well first, if you're breathing, mm -hmm. there's one thing to be grateful for, you know, and you can quickly settle into That's right. realizing that things are not as bad as they seem and that there is a way through it and you mm -hmm. can get through it. And you just have to love yourself and forgive yourself and forgive other people. And mm -hmm. anything truly is possible and dreams really do work. And for anyone out there who's watching this and is thinking like, well, I don't have, I can't feed my kids. I can't pay my rent. How do you expect me to, you know, you just people who are struggling to survive right now. I think my biggest piece of advice is to siphon from the struggle, right? Siphon that struggle, that shitty, that pain, not having money, not being able to provide there's something, there's a power in that, right? While it hurts and it sucks, mm. it there's it's a massive pool of energy to pull from. And it does make you stronger and it does make you interesting. And it does give you energy to achieve the things that you want to. So, you know, don't think that mm. um, you know, you just people just get lucky or you know, it's no, you have to actively do things and siphon from the struggle and you can make it and mm. you know if you're thinking about picking up another substance tonight maybe don't maybe go call someone go to a 12-step meeting walk into mm -hmm. a room and find relief that you can get from you know a group of strangers because you'll see you really aren't alone mm. and your story isn't really that unique as, as, as much as you think it is right we're all in this mm. crazy world together and we lose sight of how connected we are. And remember, mm, you're not alone. So We're true. all in this together. All right. Well, we love you, Daisies. Thank you so much for listening. Um, share this and comment and share it with your friends or anybody you think that you know would be touched by this story. And um, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks. Thanks.